Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to episode 6 of the Straight Out of Prison podcast. I'm James K. Jones and this is my story. And I am Haley Jones and this is his story that has now become a part of my story. So, last week we talked about a lot of things. The advice, mainly, that you were given. Just prepping for prison. So, you have been in jail for one year and one day. Yep. And you got your sentence. Got my sentence. Of... Six years. Going to prison, different Mm -hmm. than jail. Yes. And after one week and a day, is that right? Yeah, it was about a week. After a a week and a day after getting sentenced, they woke you up in the middle of the night to transfer you to prison for the first time. Yes. Okay, let's start there. They woke you up in the middle of the night. So I know I said this in the last one, but just for this episode, like you usually had two or three months between the time you got sentenced to the time you actually got sent to the Department of Corrections. I had never seen anybody go in a week or even two weeks. It was it was like I think the minimum I ever saw was like two months, sometimes up to four or five months. So I had my sentence. I had my first year under me, and I, you know, kind of thought I had a little bit of time, you know, to mentally prepare, you know, to get ready to go and all things. So you were surprised? I was shocked, and I wasn't ready because they, you know, the way they do it in in that that county jail anyways was they locked you down at night, and they would, you know, close the cell doors. And I had just got a book from somebody sent me a book. I don't remember. It was a book I wanted to read, and I just, like, started sat lay down and started the book. And I used to try to read, like, deep into the night so that I could sleep as long as I could in the daytime. That was a strategy I had, I guess. But I just started my book when they popped my door, and it's like a <laughs> sound. And then they popped my door, and they came in, and they said, pack it up. And I was like, for what? And they said, you're going to, you're going, going to DOC. Pack it up. DOC? Department of Corrections. Okay. So, here we go. So. I think you wanted to talk something about the first year, like you had something you want to say about the first year. You don't remember? No. I talked about, we've talked about my first, you know, like holidays, birthday, Christmas, all things. Oh, I did. My one year anniversary of being arrested, that, that. You had just mentioned before that in that first year that after you got arrested and you were in jail for a year and a day, experiencing all the first were difficult, like Christmas, your birthday, holidays, things like that. And it just struck me that it was similar, feels very similar to when you, when someone dies, when you lose someone, the first year of... I mean, the second year is also very hard, but the first year of first, I mean, people refer to that. So you get that because you've lost your your dad, and then recently we lost your mom. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like you lose a life. You lose a life that's important to you, like my mom or dad. Yeah. But for you, it was almost like you were losing your own life. I did lose my own life. And mourning that, and the first year of missing the things from that life, which for me, the first of missing... The things, well, when my dad passed away and then my mom, but the first are always difficult, I think, because you're basically just facing the truth and reality of your new situation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, uh, and I've told you this, like that first birthday, first Christmas, first everything was so, uh, I think Christmas, the first Christmas was the hardest for me because it was just, it was just devastating. Yeah, you talked about that. And especially to see that life was going on without me. You know, right. And I know that's selfish, but that's where I was at, you know. After that, it wasn't quite as hard. I mean, it never was. I won't ever say it's easy to be away from your family for the holidays or whatever. But there was never, it was never quite as devastating as that first one. But you were about to cycle into a whole set of new first being in prison, right? Yeah, it's a different, it's a different world. Okay, so they woke you up in the middle of the night. They put you on a... Bus or a van? <laughs> That's what I see well, in the yeah. movies. It depends on the state, and it depends on it depends on a lot. It depends on your uh, security status. You know, there's all kind of different reasons. If you're low security, you can you can go on a bus. I was always high security because I had because of my crimes, and then 
One thing I had was when I pleaded guilty to battery on a law enforcement officer, that was my first charge that I pled guilty to, that followed me everywhere. That actually follows me to this day. I got pulled over for speeding once about seven, eight years after I was out of prison. The officer, when he ran my license and ran my tag, and I learned this because I have a friend that's a Hoover police officer. Mm -hmm. He told me 99% of the time we pull somebody over, we run them, we run their thing to see if they have anything active, and we run their tag to make sure everything's right. He said, but if, if I wanted, if I was bored and I had some suspicions or something, I could run your record, and it would take another 10 or 15 minutes, but they would, they could come back and tell me everything you'd ever been charged with. And this day, that cop actually did that. And when they see battery on a law enforcement officer, that ups the game for them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he came back and made me get out of the car and was tearing the car up. You know, and I wasn't doing anything wrong. I mean, I was speeding, so I was wrong, and called for backup. And I was uh, it freaked me out. But in the process of that, the other guy, another police officer, came, and I asked him. I said my friend's name, who's a who's a police officer, and he said, "How do you know him?" And I said, "Oh, we go we go to church together. He's a good friend of mine." And then the guy stopped what he was doing, wrote me a ticket, and let me go. But these things can follow you, and battery on law enforcement officer. Um, Follow me all through prison. So that made you a high risk in the transfer? Yes. So what does a high risk transfer look like? They're just smaller. What's smaller? The transfers. Like you would you would not be, like they might do a bus. Like if you're taking people to um, have like low level crimes, they might put them like 30 of them on a bus. But somebody with crimes like mine, you would probably be, at least while you're still in county custody, you would probably be, you know, three or four people at a time. Okay. So, and are you in chains or? Oh, are you in chains? I had been, I had talked about other transfers. I don't think I've ever been chained up like I was that night. I just remember they took us down and it was freezing cold. It was uh, the middle of January. Okay. And it was in Florida, but it, I never realized it got that cold in like Panama City, but it was cold that night. And I remember they put shackles on my feet. They put a chain around my waist and uh, handcuffed my hands in the front of me and then took the chain and pulled it up and cha and handcuffed it to my wrists. I mean, basically, I wasn't going nowhere. I wasn't getting out. I remember the thing that bothered me more than anything that night was when they pulled the chain around my belly. It was like, gosh, I sure have gained a lot of weight sitting in the county jail <laughs> for a year. But uh, they had me in a holding cell by myself, and I knew there were probably other people going with me. And... Something that night was just like a, a pure gift, just seemed like from heaven, was the door open and a guy that I knew that had been my uh, cell partner for some time was also going to prison and he was going with me. And I just remember just like shocked. First I was shocked that I was going that quickly and then I, I you know, see I hadn't saw him in two or three months and just like, hey, there's somebody I know. Like, and plus, he had been to prison before, so he knew the he knew the rules, he knew the game. And I was terrified of going to Lake Butler because I'd heard all the stories about how they, you know, they they will beat you down, break you into, do whatever they got to do to uh, make sure you're ready to go to one of their prison camps. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of fear. And then on the ride there, it was probably like a. It seemed like. 10 hours, but it was probably like an hour or two. It wasn't that long of a ride, but it was just, uh, just the fear, you know, I'm going to prison and then just being scared of what I was going to face when I got there. And then, you know, you do a lot of reflection. I mean, plus it was like dark. It was a dark night where the moon was not really hardly out. So it was like almost like black and, you know, it just, a lot of reflection, you know, how did I get here? Why did this happen to me? Feeling sorry for myself. Stuff. It definitely seems like a scene <clears throat> from a movie. I mean, a scene, that's what I think of because it's so it hard felt, for me to imagine. It felt like a scene from a movie. Like, that first day, it was almost like I was watching this, but it wasn't really happening to me. It was like my mind couldn't absorb the reality of what I had done to myself and where I was headed and you know, what I was having to face and having to deal with. Mm -hmm. And then we, uh, seems like we got there, when we got there, it was like the dawn was cracking, so the light was coming out. I don't know where, I still don't know where this place is, it's in the middle of nowhere. But it is a huge prison complex, and they pull into this bay. It's almost like a, 
You know, like when you go to the bus station and the buses pull up? Yeah. It's like that, but it's enclosed. So there's like a, mm. a steel door that goes down behind you. And then they take you off. And when we got off the the van, you're like in this like, it's almost like a, like a Greyhound bus station. But it, it, you're standing, they make you stand single file. And you have the few things that they let you bring with you, which was very not many things you could bring. And then it kind of shocked me. After we got there, why they even let you bring anything? Because they take it off from you. You you end up with you start over with the little brown bag that they give you. First thing they do is they make everybody strip butt naked. And I had already been warned this was going to happen. This was this was what they did. And you know just the humiliation of that. Mm-hmm. that um, there was probably thirty guys there. That they, they they do they do like a a full processing day or whatever there's probably like 30 guys there and they kind of they lined us up made us strip butt naked and then they i so think so you're all standing like in a line or in a room just butt we're naked. standing side by side not okay. so you don't really have to look at anybody but you know you're naked right you, you feel you know and then they come by and they do like a body search mm-hmm. and i had had that done in the county jail but the difference between how they do it in prison and how they do it in the county jail are two totally different things. The prison correctional officers, they want to make sure, you know, all clear. (laughs) Um, What's all clear? Well, I mean, you can hide things on your body. Like if you wanted to have a knife or even, a, you know, I've heard, I've never seen it, but I've heard tale of like people hiding small guns and, you know, whatever. Right. Drugs, pills, you know, I... Any kind of contraband, they want to make sure you don't have it. So okay. they strip you. We they stripped us naked. We stood in that line for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, wow, just standing there naked. Yeah, but I think that's part of what they do. It's like a psychological thing. They want to let you know where you're at, who they are, and who you are. So you are nothing, and they are everything. And you will do what they say. And if you don't, then they'll take care of you. They lead you out of there. They take you into a shower. And you're oh, you're still naked, yeah. No, oh, you walk. We walk out that first day. I walked around butt naked with thirty other guys for until after lunch. So it was like a wow. five or six hours of just walking around naked. You know, balls flopping around. That in and of itself is humiliating. Well, I I, I think that's part of why they do that. It's right. like a psychological. Um, like a it's, torture. It's, it's, well, almost. maybe, but it's to break you down. Right. Like I understand why they do that. I honestly don't think they had to do all that to me, <laughs> but uh, I could see why they maybe had to do that. So they walked you into the shower. So you go into the shower. It's like this, almost like a scene from a movie. You got a big room and there's like nine or ten showers. Does that make sense on the wall? So they want you to take a shower. So you go over there and you take a shower. Then when you come out of the shower. They, like, spray you with, like, bug spray. Something about to make sure you don't have something. I don't remember the reason. But it was it was nasty. It was, when I say spray you with bug spray, it smelled like bug spray. It was rough. And then when you're done with that, you dry off, and then they, like, throw this powder all over you. So it's another kind of bug spray or lice or body bug. I don't know. They take you from there. They take you and they shave your head, and they, like, take the clippers and, like, dig them in your skin. So, Ugh. you know, you've seen me, like, with a buzz cut. Yeah. So, so it's not that. It's like they they get your head all the way down to the skin. They're not nice. And they do that for everybody? Oh, yeah, coming in. They don't, Why is that? I don't know. I think it has some, They have... Again, know, the there's psychological There's a reason thing. behind that. But, yeah. I mean, some of it is, you know, you might have lice or you might have, you know... Yeah. Really bad dandruff and they don't right. want you to have dandruff. I don't know. I'm just kidding. Then they make you go shave. So they give you this very primitive razor. It was like a a straight razor from hell. And they don't give you shaving cream. They gave us like, you know, you had to do it like with a bar of soap and shave. And they have these like ID cards that they rub across your face. And if it makes any noise, it means you're not shaved enough. So you got to go back and do it again. And I have been prepped on that too. Like you, I practiced shaving when I was in the county jail because in um, 
in prison, you have to be, you have to conform. So, um, unless you have a shaving pass, Mm -hmm. which you had to get from a doctor, um, you had to be like clean shaven every day. And it's hard to get, get that close of a shave with those crappy razors. So you ended up, you know, your face is all cut up, your, your head hurts from all the, you know, they've shaven you down and then you just, you just feel violated, I guess, you know. These people just put bug spray on me. Don't they know I know how to... My mama taught me how to bathe. <laughs> well, you are more... Have better hygiene than most men, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. But uh, that that was rough. And then they take you to do your ID card and to give you your DC number. So... And they drill into your head. Your DC number is who you are. You're not... What does DC stand for? Department of Corrections. Okay. And uh, your DC number, your Department of Corrections number, you don't even need to remember your name. You need to remember your DC number, basically. So my DC number they gave me was 566401. That's easy. That's a number that will live in infamy. It's kind of harder now in Florida. They have letters in front of them because they have so many prisoners. So people coming 566401. Through. That is my number until I die. So that if, was my question. So is there another 566401? No, that's my no. number until I die. If I were to get arrested and go back to prison in Florida, my DC number would be 566401. So wow. God forbid that ever happened, but that's that's part of it. And I have my own unique number in Alabama too. It's they call them AIS numbers. That number is 190063. So I actually have two, so I'm a 566401 and a 190063. That's a lot of numbers to remember. <laughs> you don't forget them. You have, to, you have to say your number over and over every day. In the morning at count time, they come by inmate Jones 566401. You have to learn how to do that. They do that. Um, they count like four or five times a day. And if you have any mail, any anything that happens to you after that, if it don't have your DC number on it, you don't get it. It just goes right back. Wow. And then um, when I sat down, it was a very obnoxious guy that was doing the ID cards and giving me my number and all that stuff. They would confirm, like, what color is your hair? Brown. What color is your eyes? And I said, green. And he looked at me and kind of glared at me. He said, yeah, they brown now. And so I was like, okay. I mean. Why did he? Why? I don't know. I guess my eyes look brown. You know, my eyes change. but, But my eyes are green. Yeah, I'm looking at them right now. They're definitely <laughs> green. I don't know. It was just, it, but it was so, it made me laugh because I was like, I don't care what you put on a prison ID. I mean, put whatever you want, put purple. I don't care. But I guess it was just a, like you have said before, a power play, just making sure you knew who was in charge. Maybe, or maybe they thought I was lying about my eye color. I don't know. It was, it was, that whole thing was bizarre to me, that whole little. Thing. Oh, but the guy that I went with, his was worse, way worse than mine. I have green eyes. My ID said I had brown eyes, which was fine. They misspelled his name. His last name was Wimmer, W-I-M-M-E-R. Um, I won't say his first name. But they misspelled his name, and they somehow got an L in instead of an M. So when he got his ID card, his name, his last name was Wilmer. Wilmer. So he went from Wilmer to Wilmer. And they told him to shut up. That was his name now. So they made a like a uh, an error in typing it in, and then they just decided not to fix it. And for the rest of his time in prison, his name was his last name was Wilmer. Wow. So if he had mail, it had to say Wilmer, and that was just it was like a I don't know if you'd call that a power play, but it was like well, basically they can just do whatever they want. Well, you you belong to them, right? You you I mean, and again. You know, you could listen to my story and be like, oh, poor you. But I did this to myself. This is what happens mm-hmm. when you uh, when you decide to do crime. Yeah. Or like my uncle said, if you're going to dance, you got to pay the fiddler. Yeah. So it was time for me to pay the fiddler. I think it was four or five hours we were naked because they would make us go back and sit. And it was like these cold metal like benches. And it was just so awkward to be sitting naked. I just... Awkward and weird and cold and, uh, did, you know, you get confused, like, what what's happening? Maybe that's part of the process for that, too. But they take you from there and they uh, get you dressed for whatever's next. And you didn't know what was next. You just keep doing whatever they tell you. And that 
like that group of like 20 guys, we stayed together all day until we got our housing assignment. The next place they took us was to get our clothes. So your clothes when you're in, in the... Finally. Yeah, no, yes. it was nice to put on those. <laughs> Everything is made by people in prison. So they have like certain camps where they sew pants, certain camps where they sew shirts, certain camps where they make socks and sew boxers and stuff like that. And everything was like, you know how I am about my like my stuff. Like I want it to feel comfortable, mm-hmm. like especially like underwear and stuff that's going to touch my body. Yes. There was no comfort in any of that. It was like they found the roughest fabric and then the roughest thread and, you know, that was your boxers. So that part was hard, you know, like, and plus I didn't wear boxers. I always just wore regular underwear. But um, Dude, thank you. Sure, <laughs> everyone no, I mean, listening wants to know that. No, but it's a different. Like, if you're not used to wearing boxers, boxers are like loose, and then when you put your pants on over them, everything gets tumbled up, and <laughs> it's just. It was just. I just remember feeling awkward, just so awkward, like trying to figure out, okay, how does this? Like, I must be better not to have anything down there than having all that. You know, okay. it's just a lot of activity going on. So, how many was? Did you only get one? Outfit or uniform or whatever you call it, or you got two. Um, okay. In Florida, everything was blue. So if you're an inmate, you're dressed out in blue. In Alabama, if you're an inmate, you're dressed out in white. I don't know why the difference. Just whoever the state is, they decide what they want to mm-hmm. like make their uniforms out of. But they were blue button-up shirts, kind of like loose dress pants, kind of like that fabric then you find out you can't have your shoes like they told me my shoes were not good they didn't pass something they had to pass so they gave me a pair of like those slide on things that they made in some camp prison slides no you actually got shoes when you went to prison (laughs) you had to have you had to have prison slides because i mean you had to have shower slides to take a shower okay so side note he got these shoes did i get you these shoes or one of us bought some shoes. They were the slide shoes that are popular now again, ironically, where they have one thing over the top of your foot. Yeah, you just right? slide your foot right in. Yeah, was it I that bought you them or you bought me some? I, some, I got a pair. I don't remember if I bought them or they were bought for me, but I told you they were prison slides. Yes, yeah, so... And, and they look like prison he slides. He explained to me because he had some... In prison, I guess, for the showers and stuff. But now, you know, they're super popular. You see everybody wearing them. I mean, they're very comfortable. So There's like there's some Nikes, Adidas. You just so I them. told our daughter when she was like four, I got her some. And I said, look, Mommy got you some prison slides. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> anyway, that makes me think of that. So <laughs> we forever call those. Prison slides. <laughs> yes. That is what they look like. Yeah. And in, in prison, now, you never let your bare foot touch the ground. I learned that my first week in jail because it's nasty. Because, you know, there's so many people, so much uh, so much activity. You could catch something. Ugh. No, seriously. And yeah. I know people that have, but I, I never caught anything because I was always very... Uh, I treated prison surfaces like the coronavirus. Like, I'm <laughs> whatever I need to do to stay away from it. But you had to wear your slides to take a shower. Okay. So, actually, when I first got out of prison, it was hard for me not to wear slides in the shower because I'd gotten so used to <laughs> I'm serious. I'd gotten so used to it. So, they give you uh, your, your prison clothes. They give you two pairs of boxers, two T-shirts, two button-up shirts, two pairs of pants, a belt, and... Later on, you could get shoes sent in, but for that first season, they took my shoes because they said they were some kind of security risk. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. They have all these rules in Fedutton. If it's not everything they say, they take it. So they gave me these, like, uh, they're just like slip-on shoes, kind of like the ones our boys wear, the red ones. Yeah. You just slide them on your foot. Right. But these were not comfortable. It was like you had a thin piece of plastic with some material over it, so it was hard to walk. And you did a lot of walking that first day. Lord, have mercy. So they take you from there. They took us to lunch. The one thing I noted was, wow, when you get to prison, they feed you good. (laughs) Because, I mean, it was a, you know, they fed you really good. Um, Compared to jail. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh So what was your first meal in prison? What did you get? It was uh 
I can't really say. It was like meatloaf and potatoes and yeast rolls and dessert. I mean, it was a big, and you know, I was, feast. Well, you know, I was a year, by that time, a year and two days locked up and mm-hmm. hadn't really, you know, Bay County Jail was a little bit better than Jefferson County Jail, but it was still not good. But yeah, they fed you really good. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, they were going to fatten you up. Actually, I think my little bit of time that I spent there, I think I gained like 20 pounds. Wow. Well, they feed you all the time. That first day, I'm not sure where Lake Butler is. It's in Florida. It's in North Florida. But it must be close to the ocean because there are seagulls. Don't Mm -hmm. you have to be close to the ocean to have seagulls? Yeah, I'm from Alabama. I don't know. Well, I'm from Florida, and I don't know either, so. Well, the seagulls would come, like these huge flocks of them would come outside the chow hall where they fed us. And I guess, like, trying to get something to eat. And they told us if we fed the seagulls that they would uh, beat us down and lock us up. So, wow. <laughs> so for some reason, they didn't want the seagulls on there. Well, they are kind of aggressive. I mean, I did grow up on the beach or in Florida. And when you start feeding them, it's like they go to all their friends and they are not shy to come get food. Oh, there was a lot of them there. It was like a their little flying in. It looked like a building almost. Yeah. And wow. I just remember watching the seagulls thinking... They can just fly into prison and turn around and just fly out of prison. <laughs> like what I would give right now to be a seagull. <laughs> but it uh, it was, uh, they kept you busy, so it was quite a day. But then they put you through like this battery of like tests. They measure like your mental aptitude. They go through just all kind of like just stuff. It's a full day, and you have your little bag with your clothes in it, and that's all you have. And you have to have your name tag, you know, hanging out where they can see it. And um, just the emotional, like, I'm in prison. I am inmate Jones, 566401. What's become of me? Um, And then they, they put you through, like, these medical... You know, they do all kind of medical stuff to make sure, you know, what your health is. And they do blood tests. And it's so much different going to the doctor when you're in prison than it is. Didn't they do, or maybe I misheard, but didn't they do a similar thing at the reception desk or the reception center where you said they evaluated you in every circle in every way? Like but, temperature, blood work before you're going to prison or that was maybe when you were going into prison the reception center is where we are now oh okay, okay. <laughs> sorry i'm getting i get them all confused okay so this is the reception we're in the reception okay. center got it and basically a reception center they figure out where you're going but i had been taught by the older guys like if you keep your head down and don't draw attention to yourself, you'll make it through and you'll be there two or three weeks and you'll get to your camp and everything will be fine and it won't won't be so scary. So the thing at Lake Butler you had to fear were the police because they were there to make sure you knew who you were. Um, once you got to your regular camp, then you kind of had to fear the other inmates because it was a little bit different. But this one, you wanted to do everything you could to not draw attention to yourself. So I guess I just didn't realize that you could spend two to three weeks in the reception center. It's a prison. Okay. See, I didn't. I didn't connect. I didn't understand that. Well, you wow. might. You might also get some. They tap certain inmates and they keep them there. That becomes okay. their permanent party. Oh, and then wow. they like their their work part of their job is to help other prisoners come in and get off. Oh, okay. I didn't get tapped for that. Thank God. The things that they did there are mostly mind games. Mm-hmm. But like. That especially that first day, it was like, okay, we're gonna go up these steps. If I hear one sound, you're gonna all go down and start over again. Oh my god! No, and this is like twenty or thirty guys. So you start up the steps and you'd be trying to like tiptoe, but how hard? Like you wouldn't have made it through, Haley. <laughs> <laughs> we we've talked about like it's hard for you to sit for the podcast and not not. Not make extra noise. That's another podcast. <laughs> We're going to talk about how but he does it, not want me to move. No, I just don't want you to make sounds that are going to get on the podcast. <laughs> so they did stupid stuff like that, things that didn't make sense, but you had to do it. 
I think we went back and started over the stairs like three or four times before we finally were like able to silently climb the steps. Um, another thing they did, if you um, caught their attention, they had this thing they called it sweeping the sun off the sidewalk. Have you ever heard of that? No. <laughs> it's not a fun game. <laughs> it's not a fun game at all. So basically they would give you, they would say from point A to point B, so from here to the end of the this uh, sidewalk, Here's the broom. I'm going to need you to sweep the sun off the sidewalk. So that meant you took the broom and you swept the sidewalk. And they wouldn't, you couldn't stop. If you stopped, they'd holler at you until the sun was swept off of it. Does that mean until the sun goes down? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) (laughs) So it was that. I don't think I I watched people sweep the sun off the sidewalk and I was like, I'm not getting caught up in that. See, to me, I just. It's that a mind would, thing. Yeah, it's a mind thing, but if you're going to play mind games, you may as well do something that's productive and doing something. They didn't have anything there for you to do. Golly. It was No, no. It gets worse than that. I, I didn't have to do this one either, but I watched some people do it, and I thought, I think I would have to tell them to beat me up. Like, go ahead and just beat me down. I feel like I could endure something like that if I felt like I was actually, even as, like, if there was stuff on the sidewalk to be gotten off that took that long, that I was actually doing something. The other one was they had a field, and they had telephone poles on the field, and they would take two guys, tell them to pick the telephone pole up, tell them to take it down the field. That sounds easy enough, right? And then they would get it down the field, they tell them to drop it, they drop it, and then they say, pick it up again. Bring it back again. For no reason? It was it was a disciplinary thing. It was they got in some kind of trouble. Oh, Lord. And then the other one was, and I actually did, I got this punishment one time. I didn't like it, but uh, I used to smoke cigarettes when I, you know, back in the day. Well, when I was there, I was smoking two packs a day. But uh, if they caught you flipping a cigarette butt somewhere, they would give you a can until you had to fill it up with cigarette butts like one of those big number 10 cans, like a bean can. And that happened to me. And um, I learned my lesson real quick about that because they were so (laughs) paranoid there. Like, height of paranoia about everything was that you couldn't find any cigarette butts. So you'd have to go around and be begging people, please let me have your cigarette butt so I can get this thing filled (laughs) up. And that took hours. But uh, (laughs) there was that, and then there was just the... uh, just the overall, you know, you're walking in prison and you're the new people and it was definitely worse at other camps, but you still, you, you had that feeling of, you know, I'm fresh meat or whatever. You right. Know, and you're scared. So you did feel that. I mean, you felt it by how people were looking at you. You could just sense that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Lake Butler is different from prison, and, you know, when I go to my first camp, we'll talk about that in the next episode, I guess, um, the difference. But this one was fear of the police. Okay. Fear the fear of the correctional officers. You did, you know, feel a little discomfort of people looking at you, but um, I had heard so many stories about what they did there to people to break them down. There was a story that there was a, a black guy that was in one of the cell blocks there and that he didn't like thugs or gangsters or whatever. So when he saw another black guy with gold teeth in his mouth, he would like mark them and target them until he could. They did something where he could hit them in the mouth and he would knock out their teeth. And oh my gosh, that I never saw this, so I don't know if it's true. But the thing was that he had a five-gallon pickle jar full of gold teeth that he kept. That was his trophy. You would think in your mind that oh, I can't be that bad. You know, it can't be like nobody's that crazy but these people at lake butler were really they really were that crazy the shower situation still have never have never uh experienced anything like that they would line us up like a hundred guys and you would line up in a line with your towel they would they didn't make you stay naked but you had to like have your towel on your shower slides and your soap um you would line up and they had this one little place with two showers you would walk up to the shower two at a time wet yourself then you would back up and then the people you would back up to soap up and then the people behind you when you backed up the other two behind you would come up to get wet by the time they got wet and backed up again it was your time to rinse you had like 45 seconds to take a shower 
And you know how I am with my showers. But again, I think that was a thing they did to like break you of whatever you need to be broken of and to make shower time fast. That marked me. I've been told whatever you do, if you can if you can lay low and don't draw attention to yourself, you won't have any problems. So I had an older guy tell me one time, just don't make eye contact. If you make eye contact with one of the, the correctional officers at Lake Butler, they're going to either make an example of you or they're going to uh, mess with you, you know, just provoke you, whatever. And it, it worked for me. I never made eye contact. One time, I think on my first day, I accidentally made eye contact with somebody and he made me come over and he scraped his thing on my face to see if I had... You know, if I was shaving close enough, never mind, I was bleeding. There was a guy that was on in that group with me that had a pair of red shoes, and this was 1994. I know we see red shoes everywhere we go now. Right. Um, red shoes were not that common back in those days. But they were red shoes, and they had, like, a uh, different color, like, shoestrings on it or something like that. And the older, it was his first time to prison, too. I remember his name. I'm not going to say it. But he ended up going to Brevard with me. He got beat up every day by the police. And they told him, the older guys told him, you, bro, get rid of the red shoes. You don't trust me. And you don't, you don't want the red shoes. Not here. You don't want the red shoes. And he got pulled out, out of line, beat up, slapped around every day for like five days. And he traded his shoes to another guy and got a pair of plain blue shoes like we were wearing. Didn't get messed with anymore, but the guy he traded shoes with got messed with every day. So, what is up with that? I don't understand. I, you, it's a different world, and just I mean, is it just because he was being too flashy, or it's I you're, don't know. you're drawing attention to yourself? The thing, the way to get through Lake Butler, North Florida Reception Center, is to put your head down, say yes sir, no sir, and do whatever they tell you to do, and that's you know. It just ain't no getting around it. But I did learn an incredible amount of like patience and endurance through that. It was like, you know, I can I can do whatever I got to do. You know, I can I put myself here. I've got to pay the piper. It's time to do that, and um, I can figure out how to navigate through it. But it was exhausting because that first day you're just you don't know what to expect. You're scared. You just don't know. You don't know. You just don't know. And it was. Uh, when I say military, this was more like all the prisons I was in in Florida were like were ran like military. But I guess Lake Butler was like boot camp. You know, you see the movies right. of you know going through boot camp and them hollering at them, screaming at them, talking about their mama. It was very similar to that. That's crazy. I honestly I can't imagine. It was it was an experience. I learned how to, you know, I learned how to submit. I think. Up to that point, I had not learned how to do that. Oh, and up to that point, I'd never seen a black redneck, but there were like three <laughs> or four. I mean, no, you I have, mean. You have to define, though, it, for me and everyone else, how do you define someone as a black redneck? Okay, so there, they're black, obviously. We can so skip that, to the redneck. There's part. a black guy. He was an officer. There was actually two or three of them, but this one, it just fascinated me. I was like, I'd never, it's like. Uh, I knew black people and I knew rednecks, but I'd never seen them twined into one. <laughs> so he like wore like cowboy boots. He had a cowboy hat. He chewed tobacco and he, hey, boy, come over here, boy. Get, did you hear what I said to you, boy? You no, know, he talked like a redneck. I mean, I'm pretty sure he had country music playing in his 4 by 4 when he got out. Well, it's so funny you say that because, like we mentioned before, I lived in Sweden before in Europe, in Nordic <laughs> country. You fit right in, didn't you? No, but I remember having the same thought when, because people think of Swedish people, and they are for the most part, tall, blonde, um, beautiful. I mean, they're they're you're beautiful. And thank blonde. you. <laughs> but they're not so tall. Average person is probably more beautiful than the average person in America. I'm just gonna say that. I'll I'll go ahead and disagree <laughs> with that. <laughs> but anyway, I realize that there are Swedish rednecks, and there's actually really? a term for them. In Swedish, they call them a raggedy, which is like a raggedy, like a. <laughs> <laughs> 
a ragger, I guess is how you would. A ragger. A ragger, I think. I mean, um, any Swedish person listening, feel free to correct me. But there is, and they drive these cars, and it really is like a Swedish version of a redneck. And you can hear in their Swedish accent that they sound a little more country, if you want to put it as that. They have long hair, like the mullets, just kind of, I mean, what an American movie will make fun of or like portray as a redneck yeah i mean we all have that vision in our head it is like a swedish version of that and so i guess it's true maybe in every culture or country maybe there's a redneck <laughs> version well you from know that country <laughs> we've always been told that rednecks come from alabama mississippi right i mean that's the stereotype i traveled from alabama in a car we did a road trip to denver colorado in 2007 i believe it was but when I got to Tennessee, I saw rednecks. When I got to Missouri, rednecks. I got. We went through uh, Kansas, rednecks. We went through Arkansas, rednecks. We went through Colorado, rednecks. Everywhere I went, there were rednecks. So I'm like, we just get a bad rap for being from Alabama. I don't. I'm and let me it. just clarify though, James self proclaims himself as part redneck. He even <laughs> says sometimes about our kids, well, they are half redneck. I'm like, no, they are not. He's like, okay, they're a quarter. They're a quarter redneck. Well I change it. Well okay, I got like my dad's side of the family, the Atlanta, Georgia side. And so just so you the know Alabama side. He's not being completely like derogatory. There he I don't, actually No, I don't mean that as a derogatory <laughs> term. It's just um And I don't either, but it's uh, you know, we know, we all know I think what we see in our heads and I did find it shocking. It really was like, wow, this is like when it hit me one day, this is the Swedish version of like redneck or whatever. Well, that day I saw the black correctional officer version of that. <laughs> the black. And oh, if, he was a correctional. I think I missed that. Okay. Yeah. He was a no, not an officer. inmate. No, okay. he was. No, he was somebody with some authority because they had like they walked around with like them little sticks they would beat you with. Mm-hmm. They didn't play there at Lake Butler, and it wasn't. You know, once I got to my permanent camp, you you see d- different. There's something about that place that was like a, it's like a proving ground. It's like boot camp. It's like a testing ground because if you got in trouble there, they had like lockups that they would put you in, and you could stay there and rot because you you couldn't you could. I don't think you really got mail there. It wasn't out a lot. You didn't have any like rights or privileges, so. You were just, you needed to get through that as fast as possible mm-hmm. and not uh, not draw attention to yourself, not get in trouble, not, you know, if they told you to sweep the sun off the sidewalk, just sweep the sun off the sidewalk, you know, as frustrating as that sounds. Just do what you're just told. Just do it. If they tell you, you know, we're going to walk with these steps, I don't want to hear a sound, just learn how to walk like your feet are made of cotton. And, um, I mean, and I did. I, I I had one episode where I almost got into it with the correction officer because he was, like, questioning me about why I was there. You know, he was asking me my charges. And I didn't know then. They don't they don't know why you're there. He was, like, trying to bait me into something. And he had told me to get off my bunk and come here. And he got distracted by another officer. And so I never made it, and he forgot about me. So he didn't mess with me. That first night was... Uh, you know, because it's like everything you see in the movies, but I don't want to say more. It's probably less, but it was, you know, you're on a cell block. There's these long rows of cells with, uh, you know, you got your little toilet in there and, um, you know, somebody under you, some somebody on the bottom, somebody on the top, and you have to, like, tight make your bed. Like, they'll come around. If your bed's not perfect, then they'll tear it up and you have to start over again. But they had, they taught us how to do that. That's how you make your bed. But that first night, just laying down and just seeing the bars and just realizing, you know, I'm in prison. And then um, I heard it's maybe three or four cells down. You couldn't see it because the way these were made, like if you looked out, you couldn't see anything but the hall. You couldn't see the other cells. So, but you could hear everything. Like, you can't do anything about the sound. So there was a guy three or four cells down that got into it with the officer, telling him it was the same officer, I believe, that I had had a little something with, telling him to get out, get off your bunk, come down here, come here. And then, like, hearing the slaps, like, pat, 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 pat. So, and then he was, like, taking him and jerking him against the bars. 
but then saying, why are you hitting yourself on the bars? You know what I'm saying? So uh-huh. it was just like, you can't win this game. So you got to submit. You got to do whatever. No. Uh, well, even hearing you say that, it's like the movies, except you want to say more, but maybe less. But I think it just reminds me of, we don't know what we don't know. And you can, until you have experienced something yourself, you really don't understand. I mean, I can watch the movie about prisons. I can see, you know, which I have. And I can even hear you tell it, which is fascinating. And I feel like we say in the beginning it's part of my story. But I really will never know, hopefully, how this feels and how it feels to walk that out. I mean, I'll never forget. It was actually a friend of mine. She was buying a house, and she it was like this big deal, and she wanted to talk about it all the time, and... I mean, I felt like I was being so, like, supportive and excited for her. And I was as much as I could be. I mean, I was super excited for her. And um, she was stressed about all the little things. So she bought the house. Fast forward two years later, I was buying a house for the first time. (laughs) And I remember thinking, like, this is a massive deal. Somehow it felt like a bigger (laughs) deal than when she was buying a house, even though I knew it was a big deal. It's because I was doing it myself and feeling all the things myself. And... I think it's the same for you, this, I mean, experience that we can watch the movies and there is lots of movies and shows that are made about it. But until you're there living it out, I mean, it's just a first hand account and it's something that I, it's fascinating because I, because I don't know, (laughs) you know. Well, let me say this too. It's different in every state. So every state is different. Every, Every state has their own like correctional system, everything they're very similar, but also different. For instance, I would, when I received my sentence, uh, you know, four or five years later in Alabama, I would have to go to Kilby, which is the Alabama reception center for for male prisoners. Totally different story. Similar in that they stripped you down, took all your stuff, made you cut your face up with a razor, but they didn't bother you. And I remember thinking, wow, this is a breeze. Y'all don't even know what they do in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was a very stark difference. But um, it was crazy to go to sleep that first night in prison, knowing I'm in prison. Lord, have mercy. God save me. Except I didn't really believe there was a God at that time. We'll go ahead and end <laughs> with that. And uh, if you stay tuned, our next episode, we'll be talking about my arrival at my permanent camp, Brevard Correctional Facility. And is there anything else you wanted to No, throw I in think... There? That was a lot. It was a scary day. So the moral of the story is crime does not pay, and (laughs) you should avoid it at all costs. Flee, flee, flee. Run from it. And also that there's (laughs) rednecks wherever you might go. Yes, yes. (laughs) And that's a true story. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. Bye. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to the Straight Out of Prison podcast. For more, follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Look up Straight Out of Prison podcast. Yes, we have pictures and people of things that we talk about during each episode. I have really loved being able to connect people and their faces and names and some other things that we've talked about on this platform. So, Straight Out of Prison podcast, Facebook and Instagram. And if you'd like to support our show, check out our website, teamjones.co.com slash podcast. Thanks, guys. See you soon.